Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event, uh, webinar, webcast, whatever you want to call us. We're online and we're here every week, almost every week. We weren't here last week, but there's a reason for that. Um, or we cover anything related to libraries. Um, the show is free and open to anyone to watch, uh, uh, both our live sessions that we do here live on Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m. Central Time, and the recordings are all posted to our website afterwards. You can go and watch all of those as well. Uh, we upload them all to YouTube, so it's very easy for anyone to go there and see any of the previous shows. We also include any PowerPoint presentations or notes or handouts or anything that um, links that will be related to a show are included in our archive pages as well, so you have all of that, those resources as well. And I said we do a mixture of things here, presentations, interviews, mini training sessions, book reviews. Uh, basically, as I said, anything library related, we are happy to have it on the show. We do bring in guest speakers sometimes, and sometimes we have library, Nebraska Library Commission staff do presentations, and that's what we have this, this morning. Um, this week is our monthly Tech Talk with Michael Sowers. Uh, Michael's the Technology Innovation Librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission. You can see him there in the corner. Wave. Um, hi, Michael. <laughs> um, he is, I'm in my office, and he has done the hall in his office because of the technical requirements, we'll call it, for doing um, today's show. <laughs> um, the necessity for him to be on a particular computer on a particular uh, connection um, to make sure this one goes um, smoothly. Um, what we have today is Michael's Tech Talk. Usually it is the last Friday of, last Wednesday of the month. I don't know why I think it's Friday. I wish it was Friday, maybe. Subconsciously, I wish it was Friday. But no, it's usually the last Wednesday of the month, but this uh, month we've bumped it up a little bit um, due to other, <coughs> other um, scheduling issues. So he is with us today. Um, or usually talks about anything techy. Sometimes he brings on speakers, guest speakers as well for his own um, session. But this week we've just got him, um, which is cool. And he's going to tell us everything you want to know about Windows 10. Or is that a little too much? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to no. do my best. Okay. All right. All right. That's cool. Then I will just hand over to you, Michael. Take it away. Tell us what you know. All right. All right, well, thank you, Krista, and good morning to everybody on the live show and anybody who's watching the recording later. Um, this month in Tech Talk here, we're going to talk about the Windows 10 technical preview. Uh, we are so at the front end of the curve here that this came out about a week and a half ago. Uh, and so that tells you how much uh, I've been playing with it, along with the fact that take a couple days out for a state conference. Um, but I got to admit, I'm, I'm pretty darn impressed with it, and I, I think you will be too. I do want to start out this session with a question. We're going to do a show of hands, which uh, so um, Krista is going to kind of give me a rough head count of what it is. Here is the question. I, w I would like to know in the audience, if you were presented with Windows 8, would you feel comfortable using it? Not would you like it. I, I don't want to get into the whether or not Windows 8 you know, is great or sucks. Just how familiar are people with it? So if you could raise your hand if you're in the audience, and if you feel like somebody sat you down on a Windows 8 machine, you would be able to use it and we're comfortable with it. I just want to, want to gauge uh, the level of Windows 8 familiarity with my audience here today. Okay. Um, on your GoToWebinar interface, there's a little raise your hand icon there. It should be in near the upper left um, section of it. You can just click there. And we I know have... some of you in the audience should be raising your hand. <laughs> <laughs> Well, right now we've got, um, ooh, somebody had their hand up and put it down. <laughs> uh -oh. Uh oh There was okay. five hands raised out of the 13 that we have logged in at the moment. Okay, but so now a little it's under under All right, yeah. great, because the, 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 I want to establish some context for this. The, the first thing I want to talk about is it's Windows 10. It's not Windows 9, okay? Why? Um, well, there have been a couple reasons given. Um, Microsoft's official reason that they gave in the presentation is that they want to show that it's the next level and there's one platform for all their devices and unfortunately Windows 1 was already taken um, and uh, so they decided to go with Windows 10. Uh, that's kind of the official reason. The uh, an unofficial uh, sarcastic reason is that they want to uh, distance themselves as much from Windows 8 as possible. Yeah, maybe that's true, maybe that's not. Um, a uh, unofficial technical reason is some coders have looked at some uh, legacy code in a lot of programs that will do a test for Windows 9 question mark 
uh, for testing for Windows 95 and Windows 98, and if you were to call the next version of Windows Windows 9, that would affect a whole lot of old legacy programs. That's so the one that's that I believe most. That's, yeah, that's so, the one that I believe. That seems the most, the other ones are kind of, meh, kind of just making up some sort of uh, marketing speak, but that one, a technical issue that could really screw up somebody's programming, I would believe that the most. Yeah, I, I tend to believe it too. Whether or not Microsoft will ever actually cop to it, I don't know, but at least yeah. it, it does make sense and there's very little to argue uh, about that one. Mm -hmm. So we are going from Windows 8 to Windows 10 and we're kind of skipping Windows 9. Um, and the other thing I want to stress, especially for this presentation, is this is the technical preview. So it is not feature complete, but amazingly enough, it is very, very stable compared to a lot of preview versions of Windows that have come out before. I remember very early previews of Windows 8, and you definitely did not want to run that on anything you used on a daily basis. Um, I still would not recommend you run this on your main machine or anything that is mission critical, but I've got it running in various uh, formats that we'll talk about towards the end and on various platforms, and I have not actually run into any actual problems. Uh, I, I could use this on a daily basis, but because it is a technical preview, I wouldn't want to use it on my main machine. Um, it is available. I will explain to you how you can get it at the end of uh, this session and how you can install it even if you don't have spare hardware. And I will remind you at this point that if you do install the technical preview, it is my understanding that it will expire in April of 2015. So this is not a permanent solution, but there will you will get updates and it will continue to work until April. Right now, the release schedule for uh, the official version of Windows 10 is uh, considered summer of next year, so summer of 2015. So we've got a good six to eight month kind of window here to start playing around with it and testing it. Um, and as for cost, uh, that is completely unofficial. Any information, Microsoft has not officially released it yet. Uh, some the kind of the common wisdom is that if you are running with version 8 or 8.1 right now, it will be a free upgrade. But Microsoft has not officially said that. And if you are running XP, uh, Vista, or 7, it will be a paid-for upgrade just like Windows 8 is right now. So, but like I said, I want to stress, very, very not official there, no official word from Microsoft on that. Um, we're at our desktop here, and I'm going to walk you through this in, a, in, in just a moment here, but one of the other things I wanted to point out to you is that the minimum specifications for running this on some hardware are extremely low. Um, the minimum specs for Windows 8 were actually lower than Windows 7, and the specs for Windows 10 are actually lower than Windows 8. Now, I'm not going to run through all sorts of picky little details about what those are, but what I am going to show you here real quick is what this PC that I'm running it on right now, um, this is just a Core 2 Duo at 2.66 gigahertz with only 2 gigs of RAM. And this thing is running smooth. Um, so, I mean, I've run it on lower specs, I've run it on higher specs, um, but this thing runs quite well. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is uh, hard drive usage on this is extremely small. This is a 500 gigabyte hard drive. I have basically installed Windows. It was a clean installation, and I have um, installed very few other additional programs. This thing's almost as stripped down as I needed it to be for this presentation, and right now I'm still only using 18 gig of storage space on my hard drive. So if you've got some older hardware with you know a 50 gig hard drive in it, you can run this sucker and you can test it and you can see uh, how it's going to work in the future. So I just want to encourage everybody to play with this. And like I said, at the end, I will show you how to actually do that. All right, so we have booted the computer. We have logged into the computer. Now, like Windows 8, you can create what's called a local login or a Windows, uh, or excuse me, a Microsoft login. I have created a Microsoft login because I am running Windows 8 on several other machines in my environment. And so I logged in as me with my Microsoft account, and it started pulling over my settings and saying, hey, I notice you have these apps installed. Would you like to install them? So you can completely integrate this into your current existing Microsoft account if you have one. Now, one of the biggest complaints about Windows 8 was that whole start screen thing. And that was kind of uh, dealt with a little bit in Windows 8.1, where uh, when you booted, you either got the start screen, the, all the big tiles, or you got the desktop. Microsoft has heard those complaints, 
and they are now adjusting Windows 10 accordingly and adding a lot of new features, which, is, which are what I'm going to walk you through. The first one here is that when you boot the computer, it's going to notice if you are in a touch environment or a keyboard mouse environment. I am running this on a desktop PC, so I have got a keyboard and a mouse. I do not have a touch screen monitor in front of me, so I am booted into my desktop. If I was running this on a tablet or a touch screen laptop, then I would be booted to the start screen with all the tiles that you see in Windows 8 and Windows 8.1 right now. So there is kind of the first uh, adjustment very similar to Windows 8.1 in this particular case. Um, you can switch back and forth. I will show you how to do that, but I'm just going to mention here again that I am currently running this demo in a keyboard, mouse, non-touch environment, so those are going to be my defaults. I have the desktop here on the screen that you're looking at. I've got my little video window up here. It's not quite running down to the bottom because I do want to keep this uh, Windows Technical Preview logo on the screen here just for anybody watching the recording later or jumps in in the middle. Um, we have the familiar uh, taskbar across the bottom of the screen and we have some buttons uh, that you should be familiar with and some that you aren't. Starting at the bottom right here, we have our time and date. Uh, we have the sound options, we have the uh, internet access options, the um, messaging center, and I have this uh, little click here where I can bring up the other icons that have been minimized into my system tray. Over on the, uh, towards the left here, we have icons for programs that have been pinned to the taskbar. Uh, even back to Windows XP, you should be familiar with this. And you can tell the ones that are kind of, uh, kind of highlighted slash glowing here. These are uh, programs that are currently running. As I hover over them, I will get previews as to what those screens look like if I open them up. So, so far, pretty much all um, uh, features that you should be familiar with. But what we have over here on the left now to, of that are two new icons and our familiar Start button. Okay? Start button did come back in Windows 8.1, but it still initiated the Start screen with all the tiles. Well, in Windows 10, they've heard the hue and cry that there was no start menu, and they have given you the start menu back, but it is not your mother's start menu. So I'm going to go ahead and click on this, and here we go. We have the start menu. Now, what you're going to notice here is that it is kind of an amalgamation of the start menu you, you were familiar with in, in uh, Vista and 7, plus the tile interface that you were familiar with from Windows 8. Uh, so you can totally get rid of those tiles if you want to. You can customize those tiles. I'm going to kind of walk you through all of this, but this is our new start menu. So I'm just going to kind of work through it here a little bit. Uh, we do have my account information that I'm currently logged in as. If I was to click on that, and I want to make sure I don't do this at the moment because we did some testing earlier, that will give me uh, information about my uh, uh, account properties, give me the ability to log out of the system and log into a different account if I wanted to. Over here to the right is our new Power Options button, and if I click that, I have my various choices such as Sleep, Shutdown, and Restart. Um, Earlier today, when I booted up, uh, some updates were downloaded, so when I clicked on the power button there, I saw an update and restart and an update and shut down option. At the moment, no updates available to me, so those options are not there. Below that, we kind of have our shortcuts, so here by default we have documents, pictures, PC settings, and our file explorer, and you'll notice our file explorer does have a little arrow there, so when I hover over it, it gets me my frequently used options uh, or folders that I have browsed recently um, available to me instead of my tiles. Below that we have recently used, oh, excuse me, we have recently used programs, so this is a dynamic area here that will change. Uh, this is something you should also be used to. And in the case of something like Notepad where you might have opened different files, excuse me, I, oh, I didn't save my previous file, that's why. Similar to with File Explorer giving you recently used things, if I had recently used some files in Notepad, those recently used files, I'm sorry, I just hit my keyboard, it would show up on the right. We then have our all apps down here, so if I want to get a complete alphabetical list of all of the programs that are installed on my machine and the different folders I have accessed, I have available that all apps, also similar to Windows 7, and I can click back and go back there. 
Now, uh, that's the left column. I'll get to the right column in a moment, but one thing I do want to show you that they've added a neat little feature here. So you notice if I go up to the top of my start menu, I have the ability to actually drag and drop. At least I'm supposed to. Yep, there we go. I can make it a little taller. I can make it shorter. And then you'll notice my tiles will adjust accordingly. So if you like a nice short squat uh, and wide menu, you can do that. Or you can drag it up to um, that. Basically, this is going to influence how many tiles you can see. Although, as you add tiles, it will automatically expand. More importantly, it's going to uh, control how much you see in the left-hand column of that start menu. Down in the bottom uh, of the start menu in the left-hand column, we do have a search functionality. Now, many of you familiar with Windows uh, 7 uh, know that you can start typing after you click the start menu. Here we also have that, but it is clearly labeled with a search everywhere. So there are a couple of different things here that can happen. One is, let's say I'm looking for a particular program that I know I've installed. For example, I know I've installed Chrome on this machine, but I don't see it here in my tiles or on my start menu. I could go to all apps and find that, or I can just start typing and get this. Now, what's going to happen, though, is it's going to offer you a lot more resources. Now, obviously, the first choice up there at the top is labeled Google Chrome. It notice that I have installed a program called Chrome, and if I'm searching for Chrome, chances are I want to run it. So at this point, I could just go ahead and click on that to run Chrome, or I could press Enter. But it's also giving me some other choices, such as here is a, the VNC Viewer for Google Chrome, and the Sunrise uh, Calendar, and an installation program. These are now other programs that is found with that keyword in it on my PC. But then going a little further down, notice we have here Tube for Chromecast and Tube for Chromecast Pro, and underneath those it says Install App. So what it is also searching against is the store for other apps related to that program. And if I was to click on this Tube for Chromecast, it would launch the App Store and it would allow me to install that program. What it is also searching is URLs that I have recently gone to. And in this case, I have here uh, in the Chrome browser, I went to a website google.com slash chrome. So not only is it finding the programs for me, or the, the program I want, it's finding other files, documents, things like that on my machine. And this is doing it almost instantaneously. Then we also have down here after the line, these are actual web searches that I may want to do. So if I was looking to download Chrome, I could just start, type Chrome, and there's my Chrome download, and that would perform an internet search for me in Bing. And I'm going to show you another way you can do this too. Um, so we've got it's the start menu search is searching your local machine for programs and content uh, and URLs, and it is also allowing you quick access to Bing searches. I do not know if you're going to be able to search, change your search provider. Let's say I would rather use uh, Google than Bing. Um, at the moment, there's no way to change that. Maybe in a future release they'll do that. Um, and I'm not going to speculate as to whether or not they will actually give us that feature. I can go ahead and press Escape, and that will take me back to my Start menu. Oh, we do have now, a question, tiles Michael. Tiles over on the right hand. We yes, do have a question. question. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I, I looks like they want to know if the install app will still come up if you need an administrator password to install any new software. Um, yeah, there is still the user authentication control that's built that you should be familiar with from any other current, vaguely current version of Windows. Um, so if you try to install a program that needs administrator privileges, it will either ask you to approve it, assuming you are an administrator, or ask you for an administrator login. So still similar, very similar. Yeah. Yep, yeah. Didn't really that, that still isn't that that hasn't changed at all. Okay. Cool. All right. Go ahead. Right. Any other questions so far? No. Anybody have any questions, type them into your questions section of your GoToWebinar interface or just say unmute me please and I can unmute you and you can ask your question using your own microphone. Yep. And Krista will happily interrupt me. <laughs> yes. Like I just did. Yep. Yep. Okay. All right. Yeah. Go ahead. I'll just keep talking. So just, just jump on in if we got a question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right, so um, uh, start menu, we have also our tiles built in here. And most of these at the moment are the default tiles that came with uh, Windows. I've added one down here at the bottom because I did install the OverDrive app. 
And so I want to talk a little bit about how tiles work here on the Start menu, but first I just want to talk a little bit about tiles because we had a number of people not familiar with Windows 8. Um, tiles in Windows 8 are a full screen sort of uh, event, uh, the new Start screen that was there, and, and I'll get to that in, and show you that before we're done. Uh, the tiles here now allow you to kind of create nice big targets for accessing programs on your machine. Tiles, I will admit, are a little more designed for a touch environment because this menu here on a, on a kind of a smaller tablet is really, it can be hard if you get nice big sausage fingers like I do to hit small targets, whereas these are nice big targets, and you'll notice there are different sizes uh, that you can uh, manipulate them with. So there's that. The other benefit to tiles is you, you have this concept of live tiles, and as uh, you may have noticed already, some of these are uh, changing, and some of them are kind of staying the way they are. Not all tiles can be live, but when there is a live tile, what will happen is information will be presented in that tile and update itself as needed. So for example, you'll notice here the, update, the, the overdrive tile for that program is showing that I'm currently reading a book called titled New Cthulhu uh, by Charlie Strauss, and that I am currently 0% in it, and that I have one book in, uh, downloaded to my account. Here, this is for the news app uh, that comes with Windows, and it is showing the latest headlines, and in this case, just one, because it's really darn important, but as it does, it will scroll through and update those headlines. Um, the store, as you'll see, has been kind of moving around a bit, and it's, in this case, marketing to you and highlighting a program it thinks you should install. The People app is something that you can use uh, to uh, integrate with Twitter and Facebook and various other social media, and then uh, as, let's say, Twitter updates come in, they can show here. I personally like live tiles. I like being able to kind of bring this up and get a glance at what's going on with the software that I've connected to my machine and my uh, other outside accounts. I've talked to another coworker where she finds that this information uh, moving around on the screen is just really annoying, and if she wants to know what the news is, she'll run the news program. Fair enough. Some people like them, some people don't. If you don't like the fact that it's a live tile, you can right-click on it, and notice here it says turn live tile off, and then that's just going to go back to the static news tile. If I want to turn it back on, I can right-click from it, right-click on it again, and turn my live tile back on, and it will start pulling that information. So you can customize this. Um, some of the other choices that you'll see as you right-click on tiles, you can unpin it from the start. So if I don't want the weather there at all, I can just do that, and it goes poof, and it's away. Okay. If I want to get something back onto it, what I can do here is do a quick search. And there's my weather app or I could install well, the Weather Channel. We'll just stick with the basic weather app. If I right click on that, there's pin to start. And if I go back to my start menu, there it is pinned at the end, and I can drag and drop these and put them wherever I want. Okay? I'm gonna add one more real, real quick here. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and actually, I'm gonna pin PC settings, because I, I really like to get into my settings there, so I'm gonna pin that to start. Okay? And you'll notice what has happened here. If I get back out, it's added a PC tile PC settings tile, and that start menu has expanded out to the right accordingly. Now, um, a few other things you can do here. I can right click on this, and I can pin something to the taskbar. Pinning to the taskbar will put it down here at the bottom in my taskbar, and I can pin that from any source. So if I wanted to pin the Windows PowerShell, I could right click and pin the taskbar there. I can change the size of it. I can make it small. I can make it medium, I can make it wide, or if I really, really like it, I can make it large, which makes it this big giant square here, and notice everything adjusts around accordingly. So you can really customize the content of this. You can rearrange it, you can say I want the weather over here, um, you can uh, turn tile, live tiles on and off, you can add tiles, you can remove tiles, you can really make this a customized experience. I, I got to admit, uh, personally, I like the big giant full screen event, but I think this is a nice compromise. This gives people that familiar start menu that they really wanted uh, and really missed from Windows 8, and, uh, but then also gives you the ability to get those tiles in there if you want them and uh, to customize them to fit your needs. If you really want that full screen environment back again, 
you can right click on the taskbar and select properties and then over here under start menu here is where it has defaulted to use the start menu and start of the start screen if I was to uncheck that I would then get instead of a start menu when I clicked on the button I would get that full screen uh, window start screen environment again um, so you can do that you can also um, have it choose to remember recently used programs and recently used apps here uh, if you want. I'm not going to go ahead and actually change that because I'm not sure what it would do to our broadcast here, but you do have that ability to get that full screen back. Additionally, going the other direction, if you're on a tablet, like I said, it's going to default to that full screen, but if you want the menu, you would just come in here again and you would check this use the start menu instead of the start screen, and then in a touch tablet environment, you can have exactly what I'm showing you here instead of that full screen if you want it. Um, so I, I, I just want to pause here for another minute if there are any questions about uh, what's going on with this start menu because really this is kind of one of the biggest new features in Windows 10. Uh, Nobody has typed in anything uh, yet. Anybody have any questions? You can use the question section, type in your question. If you want to be unmuted, just say unmute me and we can do that. Okay, well, uh, I'll you know, keep an eye on things. No, nothing yet? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and move on. And, uh, you know, like I said, if you have any uh, questions, no. just come. We do just have a comment. Nope, oh. it all seems very straightforward. You know, yes. <laughs> um, when, when I first said I was going to do this, it is interesting because um, <clears throat> the jump from 7 to 8, a lot of people had difficulty with that. Um, and so Big I, you know, changes, I, yes. It, it, was, it was massive. Mm -hmm. uh, but 10 is kind of this compromise it's 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 if if um if if windows was if windows 8 was two steps forward windows 10 is almost one step back but it's still out of seven so people from seven to eight was a big leap but from eight to ten or even seven to ten it's not that big of a leap it's, it's kind of a much smaller step and and uh, people seem to be getting used to it pretty darn quickly Okay, so um, I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to turn, I'm going to unpin the weather app from my uh, 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 taskbar there. Another, another comment, Michael? Yes. It seems like the switch from DOS to the GUI. DOS to GUI, yeah, GUI. a little yep. bit. Um, yeah, in fact, I, I do, for those of you who still like the DOS window, I have something to tell you later on in this. That, I remember uh, the DOS window, yeah. They're improving <laughs> the command line. Can you believe that? Okay, so we'll, we'll get back to that one. That one definitely is in my list. Okay. <laughs> okay, so now here's the next big thing, the next kind of big change um, that's going on in here. Um, most, if you've been using any version of Windows since Windows 95, you know that when you run a desktop program, and I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll bring up Internet Explorer here, you get it in a window. Okay, you have the minimize, the maximize, the close, um, I'm going to close that up there. You can, you know, full screen it. You can do this. You can, um, you know, make it smaller by dragging the edges. Okay, and everybody's used to that, and and everybody, I'll just say, likes it because if nothing else, that's how Windows works. Okay. Well, the problem was with what are called the Windows apps. This Internet Explorer here. This is a desktop program. Okay. Windows 8 introduced the concept of apps. And apps are actually very familiar to people except when they got them on a Windows machine. Okay? And apps are very familiar to anybody who's used an iPad or an Android phone or, or anything where you can sit that isn't a desktop where you would install an application an app. Think of your cell phone or your iPad. If you install an app, the app runs full screen. And when you're done with it, you go home and you run another app. You don't run them in a windowed environment. Well, that's how apps worked in Windows 8. When you ran an app in Windows 8, it ran full screen. It took over everything. Okay? And that just freaked people out. <laughs> okay? I admit, there's a learning curve there, but it freaked people out. With Windows 8.1, they went to, it's still full screen, but you at least got kind of the taskbar down at the bottom. But one thing you couldn't do was you couldn't really resize that window. You, it, it, it wasn't in a window. It was full screen. They've fixed that. And I'll put, I mean, if you can see my video, I'm using air quotes here. They fixed that in Windows 10. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to run the weather app. Okay. 
This is a full screen app, but you will notice up at the top here, we have our close, our resize, our minimize, and I can now run a Windows app in an actual window. Uh, now this app, oh there we go, this app doesn't seem to be doing much at the moment, but it's, it's trying to figure out where I am so it can show me the weather. Uh, so we have now the ability to take Windows apps that you get from the App Store and actually run them in Windows and resize them and can it use my location? I'll say sure, why not? We can close them. I obviously did not run this before this uh, demonstration here, so it's asking me a bunch of different information there. There we go. And so I can run it full screen. I can run it in a window. I can scroll back and forth. If I was in a touch screen environment, I could just swipe across the screen and move it around. I can bring it up to full screen again. Basically, what they have done is they have brought back the title bar. Okay. Uh, Windows 8, there was no title bar. Windows 8.1, the title bar was there if you knew you to move your mouse up to the top of the screen. Windows 10, the title bar is back and everybody's happy about that. Me, I'm like, okay, it's back. Um, but uh, um, that's there. So you can run your apps. I'm going to run another one here real quick. I'll run PC settings just so you can kind of take a look at that. Apps now show up in the, in the taskbar down at the bottom of the screen. I can get my hover here, I can switch between them, I can move them into a window, I can resize, I've got all sorts of options available to me here. Yeah. Somebody just asked a question about that actually. Yes. Uh, someone said, I read they fixed the ability to snap the windows, they don't necessarily have to take up half the screen. Um, you can yes, customize okay. how they fill the screen, is that true? And that's what you just did, you just redid the, yeah. Okay, well actually that's a little different and bonus okay. points to whoever asked that because that's what I'm going to cover next. <laughs> ah! There you go. Okay. So, um, okay. So we've got now um, desktop programs and Windows apps now run in the same sort of environment. It used to be kind of two different environments. Now it's one environment. They're all running in Windows. Yay. Okay. So consistency, always a good thing. Snapping is a little different. Okay. Now I'm going to admit right now that I'm still getting the hang of this. So if it doesn't work as smoothly as you think it should, I will completely take the blame for that. <laughs> okay, I, I'm still getting the hang of this. Okay, so let's say that I've got my PC settings and I've got Internet Explorer running. And let's say Internet Explorer, I've got a page up that says, here's the instructions for how to do something in PC settings. So I want them next to each other so I can see them. Well, the first thing I can do is what's called snap. In Windows 8, you could snap a window to one side or the other, and so you could have two things running at the same time. In Windows 8.1, you could then adjust to make maybe one of them two-thirds and the other one one-third. You didn't have to do 50-50. They've kind of now taken that up to the next level, and so I need to kind of do things and narrate at the same time here because they have added some features that you have not seen before if you haven't looked at Windows 10. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take my, um, my Internet Explorer window and I want that to take up the left half of the screen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the, ti the, the title bar here, I'm going to drag that over to the left side of my screen, and you'll notice now we've got this kind of gray area on the left side of my screen. That's where if I let go of the mouse button, that's where it's going to drop this window. So I'm going to let go. Okay. Now, here's the new part, and this is the part you're seeing over on the right-hand side of the screen. On the right-hand side of the screen, it's now saying, hey, I've seen that you've put one program off to the left. What other running program would you like to put off to the right? And I have choices as to which program I want to choose from. And I want PC settings, so I'm going to click on that, and it's now going to fill the upper right hand side of this or excuse me the right hand side of the screen <clears throat> it used to be that like windows would kind of choose for you or it would give you your one program in one half of the screen and then leave the other half of your screen blank until you found the program you were looking for one of the benefits here now with the new snap it's called snap assist is that it will make suggestions for what it is you might want to put in the rest of the screen okay now that's a 50-50 the other thing you can now do, and this is where I'm getting a little tricky on this, so bear with me here. I'm going to make this kind of, I'm going to pull that out of my snap, 
And I'm going to drag this over to the right, but then I'm going to try to, let's see, there's a way to do this. Okay, in this case, notice it's now part of the screen. I was trying to do a quarter of the screen, and this is where I kind of got this weird two-thirds of one-half. But notice Snap Assist is still down here, and I can say, you know what, I want to put, uh, oh, weather. Wow, so, okay, this is where I'm totally blaming myself here. This is not working the way it's supposed to. You're supposed to be able to put these things into quarters. Let me see if I can get it to, it's not working. And there's my Snap Assist with my weather. Okay. Um, I've seen it demoed. I have actually pulled it off before. For some reason, I cannot get it to work today, and I'm going to completely blame me on that. But you could theoretically have four programs running in the four corners. And each time you fill in a half or a quarter, that Snap Assist will show you in the screen real estate that's left what it is you can pick from to um, uh, snap into that area. Okay? So I, I think that's what the person was getting to with the, the asking. Um, so that, that's how that kind of Snap Assist works. Now we will we'll take this to the next level in just a minute here. Uh, but uh, I will just pause for anybody who might be typing a question. That's how the new Snap Assist works. Um, the other thing is your Alt-Tab still works. So if I press Alt-Tab, but it's going to look like this. It's going to show you your open programs, give you a full-blown preview window, and it's actually going to show you what shape they're currently in. So if I want to ship out, uh, switch over to PC settings, I still have that Alt-Tab available to me. They've just kind of cleaned up that interface a little bit. Okay. And as always, the best key combination in the world, Windows key M, minimizes everything. So you can always get back to your clean desktop, excuse me, with a Windows M. Yep, the person who asked about this map said, yes, that is what I was curious about. Thanks. Yep, okay. So if you're the type of person now, i got to admit, the, the screen we're looking at here is actually a low-resolution monitor and square. Um, so that might be part of the issue with the, the snapping and getting things to line up. Um, I'm thinking that the machine I had was a higher resolution widescreen monitor and that whole putting things in corners was working much better. So uh, it could be the fact that the, the, the type of monitor that I'm using and the resolution I'm using might not be working as well with that as I would like. Okay, um, so uh, one of the other buttons we haven't talked about here, I'll get back to search in, in a few minutes, but this task view. Task view is kind of like uh, the alt tab that you're used to, but I'm going to go ahead and click on that now. Um, this brings up our Alt tab, uh, as you can see here, and then I can go ahead with my mouse, or if I was on a touch screen, switch to a program. But the other thing I want to show you here, and I know we've got some kind of higher uh, techie people in, in, in the room right now. Hi, Brig. I'm, I'm talking to you. Um, down here at the bottom, if you bring that up, we have Add a Desktop. This is something that has been around in Linux for years, um, and finally, 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 Microsoft is adding this to Windows. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to click Add a Desktop, and I now have two desktops. Okay, here's the desktop where I'm running my weather program. Okay, and so let's say here I'm running my weather program, and we're going to go ahead and bring up uh, Internet Explorer also. So we've got that going on, and let's say on this desktop, I'm just kind of tooling around, checking Facebook things like that. But if I switch over to this desktop. I now have, I can run a completely different set of programs. Over here I can run Chrome. Give that a second to launch up there. And I could run the store, let's say. So if I now switch back to this, you will see that I have this desktop with this set of programs running, but I also have this desktop with this set of programs running. Okay. So you can create, I think, four or five or six. Now you're getting into RAM and CPU issues here, but you can actually run multiple desktops on Windows now. So if you like to organize your work so that on this screen I'm working on this stuff, and then when I want to I'm going to switch over to this desktop and I'm going to work on this stuff, and kind of never the twain shall meet, you have the ability to switch between multiple desktops. Well, um, that is something apparently that was very wanted. Uh, Nathan Carr is on, says, add a desktop. Finally, finally, finally. <laughs> yes. I mean, this is, I mean, you could buy software that would add this to Windows, but why this has not been built into Windows years ago, I have absolutely mm -hmm. no idea. 
Uh, it's just one of those things where everybody's like, yay, Microsoft finally got around to it. Um, and so they did. So mm -hmm. now I, I've shown this feature to a whole bunch of people, and, and some people will look at me and go, well, why would I want more than one desktop? If the answer, if, if you're asking that question, you don't need it. <laughs> but mm -hmm. for those of us who are going, yay, we have multiple desktops, we have our reasons, and uh, we, we love this feature. What's your reason? I got to admit, personally, I don't use it all that much, but I, I <laughs> see the need. Um, right, Nathan, if you have your reason, let us know. Yeah, yeah. Do you have a um, microphone there? I can unmute you if you want to, Nathan. Let me know. Otherwise, let us know what your reason is in the Yeah, it's questions. kind of a good way to organize your work right. if you don't have multiple monitors and you really want to kind of keep, a, I, I'm going to use the word firewall in a very loose term, between what you're working on. Um, so, you know, you want to keep Facebook and, and chat running, but while you're doing your writing, you want to just completely switch over to another desktop and, and work on that writing. And so that stuff's still running in the background, but it's not it's something you want to kind of set off to the side. That's kind of about the the, the, the use case scenario I envision it with. Mm -hmm. uh, um, he's uh, oh Brig McCoy actually says I use multiple desktops all the time in Linux to separate projects. One desktop for each major project. Yeah, that could work too. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So it's 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 that it's that way of kind of organizing and separating your work, and, and that is a, a, a great way to do it. So and you know. so can you show again how that you how you actually switch desktops? What the process okay. was? Bottom left. Describe it we have a little. A start menu. We have a search. We have start start button, search button, and then we have the task view button, and you click that, and then you you will have your list of desktops down at the bottom of the screen here. And as you hover over them, it will show you which programs are running in which desktop. Cool. So, brand new button. Mm -hmm. right. Oh, and Nathan says he likes he likes to use desktops like some people use user accounts. And he says I like to flip okay. between Netflix and a desktop full of my daughter's web pages and one for my web pages. So, nice. if you have different okay. people, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that works too. All right. And yeah, and that way you don't have to log out, log back in. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So, and then if you want to close a desktop, we just go back to our task view, and there's this Got wonderful little X, little X mm -hmm. here, and I just close that, and it just closes up the desktop. Um, now, what's really interesting is it has left those pro it has now made those programs that were running available to me on my current desktop. So it didn't actually close any programs; hmm. it just closed the desktop and moved them onto your current desktop or yep. one that one that's left. What? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So. Actually, that kind of surprises me. I hadn't tried that before. <laughs> and I love how my video is now kind of hovering in the middle of the screen here. So we're going we're gonna to turn that off. Um, so it basically just jammed all the running programs onto a single desktop. Now, um, I want to stress here one more time, this is a technical preview, and these features are subject to change. So if you just looked at what happened and went, ew, that's horrible, that could change between now and next summer. Uh, so we'll see what happens. Or if you really want it, somehow tell them, keep that. <laughs> Yeah, well, and, and there is a feedback uh, mechanism here. There's this welcome to the technical preview, and mm -hmm. when I at the end when I show people how to get it, there there is a feedback mechanism that you'll um, take a look at. And it's okay, a bit so, clever than not closing programs when you close desktops. We do have a question going back to the snapping, since before we get yeah. too far away from that. Um, uh, first, Nathan really liked it. He says, Windows 10 Snap Assist is a change I didn't know that I really, really wanted. Um, but yeah. someone wants to know, can you snap things stacked or just side by side? Um, if by stacked you meant they're kind of like if if I did this and then kind of over like and then th there was a thing in Windows. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It used to be that. No, not to my knowledge. I have not seen that. Hmm. Um, it it's side by side or uh, it's 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 twenty five percent quadrants. Mm -hmm. So you could do like a fifty and two twenty fives, um, or you could do a fifty fifty or four twenty fives. Uh, but I have not seen a stack windows feature and I'm just looking right. here just for fun to see if it's there or clicking on like my desktop. A setting or something that you can choose. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I'm not seeing that. So, okay. um, yeah, I'm thinking about it. I'm, I'm not sure I've ever actually used that myself, but you know, I'm sure there's a use for it for, for somebody. Okay, so um, let me uh, close a couple of things up here. And kind of I do have another follow-up question. Somebody question? just said, yep. can you do a 50-50 horizontal instead of side-by-side, -side? like on top uh, of each other? Uh, let's <laughs> no. <laughs> it's not letting it do that now. No, because if I go up to the top, that full screens it. Mm -hmm. So, no, at the, and again, I will just say maybe later. 
Um, but right now, no, it is just horizontal. Yeah, Nathan said he uses the horizontal 50-50 a lot for Word documents, one above each other for working on two different things, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm just going to kind of make a guess here at the moment. Hor, uh, stacking horizontally, or, yeah, yeah, on top of each other, uh, when you get into widescreen monitors, can make things really hard to use. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I, now, I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. If you have a use, great, but I'm just thinking that they might not be doing it because of ultra widescreen monitors, um, where side by side works a little better than up and down. But all right, okay. So let me move on to a couple more things that I, that I want to show you here. Um, one is in the uh, file explorer. Just a qu uh, quick new little feature. Uh, there is now this home area. Um, it used to search you out in uh, this PC or my PC. Now we have a new home screen where you can uh, pin some favorites. It will show you uh, frequently used folders and then uh, recent files. Um, and if you dig into the settings, you can change what is shown here. You can um, uh, change how many recent files, things like that. Um, if I wanted to, uh, let's say in, in <coughs> favorites here, I have desktop downloads and videos. Uh, let's say I wanted to make uh, this a favorite. I can right click on that. Now my screenshots folder is a favorite. So a, a little more of kind of a default um, ac quick access to your stuff in the file explorer that uh, wasn't there before. And again, you know, it'll be useful to somebody and um, not useful to others. So uh, there you go. Okay, um, the uh, last thing I want to show you is this uh, search button down here. I mentioned earlier the searching everywhere on the start screen, but there is actually a search button now that you can click on, and that's going to kind of bring up this little search window. This, like with the search everywhere, is a Bing search at the moment. I do not know if you're going to be able to customize that in the future, but it is a, a Bing search. Um, it is supposed to remember recent searches, and I did some searches earlier this morning, and they are now not here. So I do not know where they went, but let's just do a quick uh, dummy search here for library. You will see that um, uh, that is interesting. It launched Overdrive. <laughs> I did okay. I know what happened, but I don't know why that happened. So let me let me back up here again and uh, go back to my search screen, and you will see here. Okay. Oh, here are my recent searches. Okay. I know this one works. Let's search uh, Nebraska Library Commission. What this does is this does not actually launch your browser. This launches the search app, which works like a browser, and does a Bing search on a um, you know on my keywords, basically. Um, if I shut that down and I go back here and I do uh, click on my recent search for Yaw Cam, that is also going to do a quick search, even though I do have Yaw Cam installed. Now the one I tested earlier. Um, which is kind of, I think, what happened with uh, OverDrive is um, I searched desk pins, which is the program I'm using. Uh, if you see on my video window here a, um, a little red pin here, that's what's keeping this on top of everything else. Notice if I just wait, it starts going, oh, wait, I found a help. I found the desk pins program. I found the installation zip file, and here are some other searches. If I was to press enter, and I think this is what happened with library, it ran the first thing it found. And in this case, it would have run the desk pins help. So let me set this over again. If I just click search and type library, and I just wait, okay, and I can't type library correctly, notice it does give me overdrive, ah, but then here's file history settings, home group, because these things do involve what are called libraries in that, or if I actually wanted to do a Bing search itself. So the, the difference between this search button and the search on the start menu, I'm still trying to work that out a little bit. But um, there, are, there are similar results, um, faster access to particular things, or it launches that search app. This is something I need to play with, and this is kind of why I saved it towards the end, because I'm still trying to work out the, the slight differences between these two different things. Okay, um, okay last, uh, one last thing I want to talk about before I tell you about how you can get this if you want. Uh, Windows 8, Windows 8.1, there's the charms bar, which is that thing that shows up if you take your mouse pointer and go all the way over to the right-hand side of the screen or the lower right-hand corner, and you get this um, uh, uh, the search 
uh, uh, PC settings, things like that. In this version of the technical preview, that is turned off. But that does not mean the charms bar has disappeared. In the technical preview, if you want the charms bar, you press Win C on your keyboard, and the charms bar does show up. And you have that search, share, start devices and settings along with your uh, clock date and time down here. Um, the charms are not going away. They're just kind of temporarily hidden in this particular technical preview. So if you're a Windows 8 user and are looking for the charms in Windows 10 technical preview, those are available to you. Just press Win C. In an update, eventually, uh, as, as I understand it, they'll be turning, the, turning back on the whole come in from the right or, or move your mouse pointer all the way to the right-hand side of the screen. Okay, so let's, that, that's pretty much it. That's the big features there. There's not a lot of them, but they are big changes. So let's talk about how you get it. Um, we will provide all these links to you at the end um, in our delicious account. You can either go to mine or Krista will be copying these over uh, to go in the show notes. But um, if you want to get the Windows 10 technical preview, uh, you can. It is completely available for free, and um, it's at at the moment the the URL is Microsoft.com/English-US/Windows/Preview. Just search for Microsoft Technical Preview. Uh, they ask for your email address. You sign up, and then you can download the ISO file for. Uh, the Windows 10 Technical Preview in both 32-bit uh, and 64-bit, and there are some other versions floating around if you want to run it on a server and things like that. So it is completely available to anybody who wants it. You just need to give them your email address, and then you can download a 2 to 3 gigabyte file to do that. Now, once you have that ISO file, you have a couple of options. You can burn it to a, uh, a DVD and you could install it on some hardware that you have lying around. If you've got spare hardware, I had some spare hardware uh, here, so I just went and did a completely clean install. Uh, if you've got a test machine that's running Windows 8 or Windows 7 and you want to run this, you could run it as an upgrade to an existing installation. Just please don't do this on a mission critical machine. Do this on spare hardware. That being said, Maybe you want to play with this, but you don't have any spare hardware. There's another option that works great. I've done it on several machines. The other link you want to pay attention to is a program called VMware Player. Um, now, I could spend a whole hour itself getting into the concept of virtual machines, but what this program allows you to do, it's completely free. You can download it for Windows, Windows or Linux, and I have done it for both. <coughs> you run you download and install this program, you run this program, and then you use this program to install the ISO you got from Microsoft. So what you're going to do is you run it, and you create what's called a virtual machine. And you say, um, which is just a file on your, on your computer. You then say, I want to install the technical preview to this virtual machine. It's kind of like where earlier we talked about multiple desktops. In this case, you're creating multiple computers on your computer. And you say, my ISO file is over here. Please install the technical preview as a virtual machine, as a fake computer. Then what happens is you come back, you run VMware Player, and you say, please boot my Windows 10 technical preview. And it will run the Windows 10 technical preview in a window on your existing computer. And anything you, it will act like you're running a computer in a computer, and it won't affect your main machine. It will just run in this little window, this little package itself. So my laptop that I currently take around and give presentations on, it boots to Windows 8, but then I can go to VMware Player and run Windows 10 inside a window if I want to. I've got a, an Ubuntu Linux box at home. I've installed VMware Player. I can boot to Ubuntu and then I can run the technical preview in a window if I want to test it on that hardware. So even if you don't have a spare machine, you can run it as a virtual machine and it runs slick. It installs in about 10 minutes. Um, it's really easy to use. If you've got more questions, we're kind of running short on time. I'll take a, I can take some questions about that now if you want to or you can send me an email uh, and I can happily run you through uh, how to do it. We, um, we have time if people uh, do have questions. We, we start about five after, so. 
Yeah, yeah, well, well I problem. mean, I'll take some questions now, but if somebody really needs a step-by-step, -step, we don't have a time to do that. Uh, uh, but I can, I can point you to some resources for that. So, um, you know, and I've, I've, like I said, I've run it on at least two other machines in a virtual environment, and it works great. Mm. So if you don't have spare hardware, I mean, you know, a whole desktop and a monitor and a keyboard and whatever, you can run it uh, as a VM on, on existing hardware and still get to play with it. So. Uh, Nathan wants to know, can you show again how much hard drive space Windows 10 takes up as, after it's unpacked and updated? I think you showed well, it at the beginning, yeah. but he came in um, later in the yeah, show. Yeah, I can do that. Um, okay, so this is a uh, 2.6 gigahertz machine uh, running a Core 2 Duo with only 2 gigs of RAM. So you can guess, you know, you can see how smooth this has been running. Um, it's a 500 gig hard drive, but... Uh, I have literally just installed Windows 10. There's been a couple of updates so far, and then I have installed maybe five programs. I mean, this video program you're, you're seeing me in, I installed Chrome, I installed GoToWebinar. I've installed very little on this machine, and I am now using um, just under 20, meg 20 gigs of storage. Um, the rest of it's completely empty at this point. So, you know, if you've got an old machine with a 50 gig hard drive in it, you're going to be, at least get this running, if nothing else, um, and not a lot of RAM necessary. So very low overhead. Uh, one other comment I'll make related to this issue, if you do run it in a virtual machine, um, one of the things the program will ask you is, how much of your existing RAM do you want to set aside for use by this virtual machine? So for example, on my uh, home computer, I have 10 gigabytes of RAM, but if I run Windows 10 in a virtual machine, I have to use some of that RAM for the virtual machine, and I've said 2 gigabytes, and it's run perfectly smooth, and it's running on 2 gigabytes of RAM here, so, um, you know, like I said, low overhead, and, it, and it's something you can run on old hardware or a virtual machine. He's impressed that it's only 17.9. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah, and in fact, it was, I don't know what's going on because it was 15 earlier, but uh, so <laughs> I, I downloaded something without paying attention uh, uh, going on here. Um, oh, the, uh, one other thing I'll mention for, I, I said I'd mention something about command line. Um, for, for those of you in the audience who are command line junkies, um, cut, copy, and paste have never worked the way it should in the command line. Um, you've always had to right-click and select and you could never use keyboard shortcuts for selecting text cut or uh, cut copy and paste. You had to use the mouse, things like that. They haven't turned it on yet, but they have said it is coming. You will be able to use Control V, Control C, and Control X at the command line. So if you like to copy and paste content at the command line, they are finally going to turn that on. I tested it before this show. It was not turned on yet, but that is coming. So uh, a lot of people who are command line junkies will like that. I'm sure Vern, our, our head techie here, will love that. <laughs> he practically lives at the command line. So, um, Any other uh, questions or comments coming in? Anybody have anything else they want to know? Pretty much my show. Um, mm -hmm. Like I said, not a lot, but significant. So... Mm -hmm. um, um, any comment on the folks who said that the preview has a keylogger in it? Ooh. Oh, that... okay. So I've, I've read uh, about this. Mm -hmm. Part part of the technical preview is is kind of a they are paying attention to what you're doing. Uh, they want to see how people are using it. That kind of um, makes sense to help it out. But is that cool? Do people? Is it something that they let you know right off the bat? By the way, we're doing this. There. Yes. Um, as part of the installation. There is a screen that says, as participating in this, here is kind of what you're allowing us to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I will admit I probably didn't read that as close as I could have uh, because I totally missed this, but it, I've been told it's there. Um, and I believe there are ways to customize some of those, but I, I, just, I just accepted all the defaults when I installed it. So probably another reason not to do real live work. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I got, you know, we can get in a whole conversation of, you know, if, if Google has your email, um, you know, what does Google know about you? Mm. Um, so, and, and I, I, I would trust Microsoft to not, you know, steal my eBay password, I guess, if I was doing that. Yeah, this, um, this is Brigan. He does say thanks. He's been a little more paranoid about things like that since Adobe Digital Editions 
four point X. Which yes, I okay. think <laughs> in, which I believe is in your um yeah. Yeah, it's in your links for this month. Yeah, it is. Um, uh, yeah, so, okay, yeah, usually I share a couple things in news, and so uh, here's, okay, let's, let, I was thinking of avoiding this, but since you brought it up, Greg, um, okay, so the, two, the news bits uh, that I want to cover uh, this month, just two short ones real quick here. One, one is uh, this, every, everything you need, that's supposed to be need, I don't know, I, there's a typo there, D, you need to know about the lack of ebook security in Adobe Digital Editions. Uh, it has been discovered that Adobe uh, has been collecting data on what you read. Now, I went, I you know basically went through the roof uh, in my office when I first read about this, and I intentionally said, you know what, I'm going to conference and I'm going to let this settle down before I try to have an opinion. <clears throat> it, it is a security problem. There are issues potentially with library laws, um, and they are sending the data which technically by installing the software you have agreed to, uh, they are sending the data unencrypted and in the clear. So there are some security and privacy issues there to even ignoring state library law. Um, Adobe has said that they're going to issue a patch shortly to take care of the, the greater security issue of sending in uh, that data. Uh, and it only affects, there were some rumors that said otherwise, but uh, according to all reports I've read recently, it only affects books that you download and read in Adobe Digital Editions, which from my anecdotal experience is a very small percentage of your patrons because most people are running the OverDrive app at this point. Um, I'm not saying there are no patrons who use Adobe Digital Editions, but it isn't the number that there was two years ago. So. Something you want to be familiar with, I did link to one rather sh kind of on the short end but covers the gamut of the information you need to know uh, there in that list. So um, I would say let's not everybody totally freak out, but let's definitely pay attention to this story. Um, the other one I want to show people real quick here is this is a new program out of the New York Times called Madison. Uh, and what they're trying to do here is to go through the old newspaper ads that have not been indexed in the newspaper and have uh, crowdsourced the indexing of that. I'm, I'm probably oversimplifying this a little bit, but they will bring up a page and they will highlight an ad and they will ask you, what is this ad about? So was it an ad for upholstery or was it an ad for candy? Uh, and you can provide that information. So if you're that type of person who likes to help out in a, uh, large-scale digitization project. Uh, this is something that you uh, may want to take a look at. Cool. So that's that's my news. Thank you, Brig, for making me talk <laughs> about that. Uh, Brig, Brig likes to do that. So, um, okay. Yeah. Um, and real quick before we wrap up here, has anybody in the audience actually played with Windows 10 yet, or do we? I mean, just you know, say something if you have. I, I'm getting the impression none of you have, and that's cool. But now you should. Now you know it's not that bad. Um, install it in a VM, if anything else, and uh, play with it a bit. So. All right, um, that's okay. my bit. Um, if you got cool. any other questions or comments, we'll, we'll happily take them. But I think officially, not seeing anything, mm -hmm. I'm going to send this back to Krista to wrap up. Okay. Um, yeah, Nathan says he's not played with it yet, and Briggs says we haven't touched Windows 10. We're working on convincing our current vendors to provide the Linux clients. Um, yeah, good luck with that. Yeah, okay, let me know how that goes. <laughs> sure. All right. Okay, well, thank you very much, Michael. Thank you, everyone. Um, I am going to pull back presenter control here do, 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 to my screen so that I can wrap up here. There we go. All right, so that will wrap it up for this week's um episode of Encompass Live. It has been recorded and will be posted here on our Encompass Live website to our archived sessions page here. Um, we'll have a link to the recording and I've also saved all of the links that Michael had in his delicious account related to today's show, things about um, Windows 10 and the two uh, new articles about Madison and Adobe Digital Editions are in here as well so you'll have direct links to all of those as well. Um, 
So, and so that will wrap it up for today's show. If so, hopefully you'll join us next week on Encompass Live when our topic is teen theater groups, creating communities of empowered teens. We'll have a group of librarians from up in Illinois will be joining us on the show to talk about what they've been doing with the teens in their libraries. Um, and if you are on Facebook, Encompass Live is also on Facebook, so please do like us there and you will get notifications of when new shows are starting, when um, we are... Let me get that out of the way. When uh, recordings are available, anything interesting we post about um, the show, it's mostly just an updated when the sessions are ready to go and um, when you can join in. So do like us on Facebook if you are so inclined. Other than that, that wraps us up for today. Thank you very much, and we'll see you um, next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye.